Hi, my name's Karen Crofts and I'm the director of Hunter Writers Centre. Today I'm chatting with Jennifer Locke, who is a social scientist based here in the Hunter of New South Wales. Jennifer has quite a history working in the drug and alcohol and mental health field. And Jennifer has also been a judge of the Grieve Writing Competition, along with all the other judges that we have on our panel. Uh, Jennifer's been involved in the project for a few years and both in her capacity uh, as having worked at the Hunter Institute of Mental Health but also as a social scientist working for many years in, the, in this sector. So welcome Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for Karen. chatting with us today. Oh it's a pleasure. Thanks yeah. for the invitation. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, working with mental health? And uh, I love the fact that mental health has become an integral part of the Grieve writing project because, of course, it is linked in many ways, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. That's right. And look, my uh, experience working within the uh, mental health and drug and alcohol sector um, over a number of years has really um, been very inspiring in many ways, challenging in many ways as well. Um, but also it's great to see how much the field is changing and developing. And um, also um, from the point of view of actually not just the um, service provision, but also in the coverage by media and also by people telling their own stories of lived experience which is really really important um, because there's uh, a lot of um, stigma out there that uh, around living with mental health issues and a lot of um, beliefs and attitudes that are just um, based on people's perception without actually having known anyone that is actually living with mental health issues and so um, I think that's why I was some um, very interested and, and also very passionate about being involved in the grief writing project because grief is such a big part um, of the journey for a lot of people uh, not just related to the death of a loved one but also in relation to um, many other facets of their life in relation to, to mental health and um, suicide as well. Yes, and it's not just the person who experiences the mental health experience themselves, uh, uh, but also the families, members and the friends and mm -hmm. work colleagues. So we get a number of stories and poems uh, entered into the competition, which whether they're totally based on fact or just generally on some small experience or a lifetime experience from associates, family members, friends, children, partners and so many are so sad but it really mm. does capture the grief of the sufferer themselves and their close friends and family. Do mm. you want to talk about that? Yes, look, um, it's been, as I say, it's been a real privilege to, um, to be part of the um, judges panel for the Grief Writing Awards and yes, I've seen so many different facets of um, people's emotions and experiences and journeys of talking about grief and uh, looking at um, writing as some people may see it as a, as a therapeutic way of actually putting their feelings onto paper. But often it really provides a, um, a very safe space, I feel, for people to actually uh, be able to express themselves without being judged or without um, feeling like they have to fulfill certain expectations or um, or fit in with what people's um, perceptions are around the grief process because as we're um, aware and as I've seen as I say especially working in the field for such a long period of time grief um, can come up at different times in different situations and completely take people off guard um, thinking that um, especially in context of losing a loved one that the immediate period after the loss is the hardest but that's not the case and everyone's journey I think the really important thing to acknowledge is that everyone's journey 
um, is completely unique and completely different um, depending on the circumstances, depending on what supports they have around them and also um, really on their life circumstances and what, what comes up for them as well. There's two stories that come to my mind uh, and it gets repeated many times with the entries into the competition. One type of story is the grief of a parent who knew their child probably uh, for a, quite a number of years before the clear evidence of uh, a mental health illness was revealed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of their grief can be around remembering who their child, son or daughter was before this illness took hold and struggling with living beside the person and caring for the person, often at the times of their worst uh, experiences and worst incidences, remembering what they sometimes call the person inside or the person they were before or the person that sometimes is seen and then disappears. There's that type of grief. And then more recently I read a story that the judges picked about a, a daughter's experience of a father with mental health uh, mm. and her grief was around, oh, it was so sad, the grief around not knowing when she was a little girl mm. the extent of the complexity of her father's lived experience, mm -hmm. then her, the anger that came with why can't dad just be like and then the grief when she became an adult and dad was dying of uh, re coming to realize as now an adult the complexity and then of course there's the very sad experience of the son or daughter who lost the parent who suicided mm. uh, uh, as a result of the mental health experience and then what they have to live with. Do you have any comments mm. about all that? <gasps> right, yes. Mm. Um, yes, some of the stories um, are very um, raw in their expression of uh, the grief uh, associated with, as I say, the journeys of either being the parent of a child with mental illness or the child living with a parent with mental illness. And um, I think it's um, really important to understand that um, the carer or the loved one um, really needs a lot of support through that period of time as well and and for some people that can be a lifelong support that needs to be in place and I am aware of the stories that you're talking about the entries that have come in and um, looking at the first experience of the parent whose um, child has developed a mental illness. Um, we know that um, it's just as important to involve the carers in the, um, in the process of actually supporting the person and again involving them, um, helping them to understand, having conversations and again it's looking at um, clarifying perhaps some of the myths and some of the beliefs that are out there around people that are living with mental health issues um, and again in my experience as um, doing lots of uh, education and training and professional development for um, people from the community for um, work community workers people actually working um, in the mental health sector uh, who may have not actually worked in that particular field before or whose lives hadn't intersected with anyone who has been experienced or who has experienced any mental health issues. Um, it's great to actually have the opportunity to actually just normalise that diagnosis because I generally if you have a condition which is like physical which might be you know asthma or cardiac disease or a broken leg or something that's medical um, it seems to be that people are a lot more comfortable with talking about that but with mental health there, there still seems to be um, a lot of stigma around that and the only way of actually breaking down that stigma is by actually creating a safe space where people can have conversations about it where it's not confronting where it's not they're not going to feel judged, they're not going to feel stigmatised 
and um, and there are a number of, as I say, there are a number of initiatives both locally and statewide and nationally um, that are being developed and, and have been um, in place for a number of years now to actually assist people um, with, um, with being able to actually have a good quality of life as I say, whether it's for the person that's experiencing the mental health issue or whether it's for the carer. But it's um, also uh, one of the organisations uh, is Sane Australia and they have a, um, a great range of programs. Um, one of them is um, that they actually have a uh, what's called a living library. So it's a whole, they have a, access to a whole range of people with lived experience who um, will go and do public talks, who will actually um, speak about their experience, perhaps online. Um, they've created um, interactive um, online um, blog sites and places where people can feel safe because, again, it's looking at, um, obviously, writing about grief um, is very therapeutic but also um, people can often be quite hesitant to actually go and speak to a counsellor or to a psychologist or even talking to their GP about it can be very confronting. So therefore um, a lot of the um, initiatives now um, from an online perspective um, create uh, another um, option for people to actually be able to, as I say, be able to access that from home um, and it's private and it's confidential and so it's setting up, as I say, it's being aware of setting up those safe spaces for people to be able to have those conversations. And, um, and so therefore, getting back to your questions about um, whether it's a parent with a child that has mental illness, um, the parent is able to then um, perhaps go online or to be, uh, be able to actually call somebody um, and be able to actually talk about their experiences because often the journey can be very challenging or frustrating at times and um, and so to as I say to provide as much support for them as possible um, it's really important to provide um, helplines support lines um, whether it's lifeline or beyond blue or black dog or say in Australia where people can actually go and actually speak to other people who are going through similar experiences. Yeah, so a multi-pronged approach. That's uh, right. Because not one size fits all. That's right. And there is, for instance, um, for um, children living with parents with mental illness, there is um, children of... Um, there's an organisation called um, Cope Me, who is for children um, living with parents um, or friends with mental illness. So more and more the sector is recognising that we do need a really broad range of services to be able to um, respond to people in the best way that we can. Fantastic. Um, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, just on the topic of suicide, when we first started out with the Grieve Writing Competition, mm. we didn't get many stories about mm -hmm. suicide. I don't know why, and I ne didn't necessarily uh, want them, but uh, we, I noticed that there weren't many, and now we're getting quite a few. Mm -hmm. That could be because it's, um, it's seen now more as a safe place to write about. Also, do you think the media has um, uh, taken a healthier approach and it's become, has social media played a role in the discussion about suicide? what might have changed in the last five to ten years mm -hmm. yeah look I think suicide. yeah I think the um, the landscape has definitely changed I think there are more conversations that are happening um, around suicide and we know that um, the media is reporting much more responsibly around suicide as well um, and that um, is evidence-based um, with the um, Hunter Institute of Mental Health uh, has uh, an initiative called the Mindframe National Media Initiative and they've been integral in actually um, training and working with the media to support them in how to report responsibly around suicide. And so there have been studies that have come out looking at um, media monitoring studies, looking at the number of articles that have been written um, around suicide back in um, 2001, 2002. That study was then repeated in 2007 and 2008, and it showed the quality of reporting had um, increased quite markedly. I think there was up to around about um, 75 
75 to 80 per cent compliance with the Australian Press Council guidelines on reporting on suicide. So yeah, and there is, as I say, a, a, a market increase um, in the um, not only in the amount of reporting but also in the quality of reporting, and also. I think as a ripple effect of that, um, I think people feel that they need to have a platform to be able to talk about suicide because we know that um, suicide and the grief associated with suicide can be quite different for people um, because of the, um, the way that the person died. Uh, families often feel like they don't want to share what happened. Um, they feel uh, they can often feel quite isolated um, and so therefore I think through writing about it um, it creates a, again that comes back to a really safe space for them to be able to express and externalize the grief that can often be quite internalized um, because of the fact that it was suicide versus just um, death from natural causes and I think, um, as I say, I've seen a lot of the stories that have come through um, and around suicide and it's good to see that there are more stories and more people talking about it um, as well and have an understanding of how important it is for them to feel that they actually can talk about it versus having to actually keep it silent or internalise it or just keep it within the immediate family. And um, the, again, there are a number of programmes that... Um, have been developed uh, quite recently um, around creating spaces for people to talk about suicide. Um, Conversations Matter um, is a really fantastic resource that has been developed for um, safe conversations uh, for community um, and provides um, guidelines and, and um, structure around um, how to facilitate those conversations. And it's also very important to be aware of the vicarious trauma for families as well, because um, conversations around grief and around suicide can often trigger emotions that are quite powerful uh, for people and therefore um, possibly um, put them at risk of feeling quite vulnerable and therefore it's really important to really set safe boundaries in place. Um, that's right those and that's happen. why we have this conversation like this and mm -hmm. why we like to have the judges give responses to the to the entrants who mm -hmm. write because yes uh, we are very mindful of the fact that any form of writing uh, around a difficult topic mm. no matter how much you are driven to want to do it can bring up uh, emotions that you may not have expected mm. and uh, so that's great that there are conversation matters and other initiatives where are we with suicide Jennifer what is the state of Australia and the world I know I'm not necessarily just asking a question about statistics mm -hmm. but you know we get the sense that it's worse but worse than what mm -hmm. we get the sense that uh, there's more dialogue but um, more than when so what's the state mm -hmm. or the situation mm -hmm. yeah look I think we know that um, the suicide rate for um, Australia has increased um, and there are obviously um, various responses as to or perhaps various rationales as to why that might be unfortunately we there's no silver bullet that's going to um, fix that problem but I think that um, obviously with more funding to um, allocated to programs at the prevention and education end of the um, spectrum versus the um, crisis intervention end. Um, it's kind of using the metaphor that it's better to, ha to have the, um, the ambulance at the top of the cliff versus having to go and rescue the person at the bottom of the cliff. So um, from that perspective, um, we know that there are, as I say, a number of programs that are being funded now. There's um, uh, a big initiative uh, from the point of view of um, organisations working together um, to actually look at 
respond to issues locally um, at a local perspective. Um, so it's about um, inclusive practice and collaborating with other services. So as I say, one of the um, one of the initiatives um, is a partnership with the Hunter Institute of Mental Health and um, Black Dog looking at um, piloting a, um, a program in suicide prevention um, in the Hunter and that is also um, being repeated um, at other sites across the state um, and so it's going to be looking at including um, and consulting and collaborating with um, with a, a whole range of services you know across the health sector the education around workplace wellness um, as well so it's around again provision of training um, and education for people um, and from at all ages to be able to as I say to have a have those conversations um, around if they're feeling suicidal or if people also self-harm is a really big issue as well because we know that um, there are for every one suicide there are around five suicide attempts mm. so again it's having an understanding of how we can actually um, help and support people to um, to know that there are services um, out there um, to assist them if they're feeling like they're wanting to um, to self-harm or to suicide and it's also um, really important to educate people around feeling okay about having conversations with their friends or with their loved ones or their families um, if someone's not feeling okay for the, them to feel like they don't have to have all the answers but they actually know how to have those initial conversations and then also to know where to refer them or to know where they can actually get help and support and um, one of the campaigns for instance um, is Are You OK Day which is a really fantastic initiative which runs nationally every year and it's just about asking your mate or your friend or your work colleague you know how are you are you OK and just going beyond the oh yes yeah I'm, I'm great um, if you feel like they are going through a hard time, it's actually um, equipping people to actually know how to then, as I say, to have the next level of conversation and, and encourage that person to, to seek help and to seek the right support. My impression uh, as just a parent and uh, mm -hmm. anecdotally is that the Are You OK Day has had a positive impact in the teen world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that it seems to be a you know it speaks a catchphrase that maybe works for them <coughs> and explains that it that that is and I do believe that teenagers uh, on the whole do understand it's about going beyond mm -hmm. how you going yeah and asking yeah. it in a deeper way uh, what about this uh, common phrase that's bandied about that suicide is the biggest killer of men between approximately 25 and 45. Mm -hmm. Can you comment a bit about that? Yeah, um, I think um, probably actually just going back to your point around young people and social media, um, social media has a really big part to play. Um, and again, we know that um, it's fantastic that young people are actually having those conversations. But we know that social media can either play a really positive role or a really negative role in actually... Um, in young people's lives and the way that they actually respond to um, online bullying and to different situations that um, they might be facing. So again, there are um, lots of organisations who um, are developing social media apps and safe spaces for young people to have those conversations, which is fantastic. Um, and lots of, there's lots of different apps that young people can uh, access as well. and. Um, looking at also then encouraging um, people who are who might be at risk as, as say you're right it's the <clears throat> excuse me the middle-aged males um, who have the highest rate of suicide and look there are various um, probably various um, attitudes or various opinions around why that might be mm. um, and so it's great to see initiatives such as like for instance I think one that's actually been around and one that's local is the Men's Shed for instance that was started as an initiative um, to get older men to come together because we also know that um, the highest um, uh, risk group is the eight, over 80 age group as well for suicide and so therefore there's lots of factors such as isolation and loneliness or um, you know, uh, physical, poor physical health, 
um, that can contribute to why um, males in particular have a much higher rate. Um, I think one of the other factors is uh, looking at the rates of suicide in rural remote areas as well. So again, um, because of the lack of services, the, the, uh, some of the perhaps some, some of the issues around um, the fact that men might not always feel comfortable about saying that they're actually, they don't feel okay. And having someone to be able to talk to about it, um, again, is really important. So uh, there are uh, initiatives, as I say, that are um, happening at the rural remote mental health um, level and um, looking at what can be provided for people who, as I say, who are living in communities that are quite isolated. And again, it's encouraging them to pick up the phone and call Lifeline or to, to talk to their GP or to even talk to each other um, about, you know, what's happening for them because often, you know, might be related to um, to factors out of their control such as drought, economic factors, you know, family expectations um, and it's also well, I guess one of the factors is that we know that um, it's looking at the <coughs> access to means so males um, seem to um, seem to be um, the group that, um, that use more um, I guess uh, extreme forms of um, taking their own life and so therefore again it's it's a matter of education of families as well and um, and communities to look out for each other and to to make sure that um, that you know if they do have concerns that someone is actually um, deteriorating or they notice a change in their mood or um, the way that they're um, or they might be isolating it's, it's actually knowing how to you know keep them engaged and encourage them to seek help okay so just on that on a very specific level so you have a friend who uh, not only uh, shows some signs of uh, retreat and uh, de de declining in their mental health mm -hmm. in your own lay opinion and you uh, want to bring the conversation up and you might have even uh, used the word, I understand, using the word suicide and uh, speaking quite plainly is uh, considered important to mm -hmm. not beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. So you bring these words up and you, you either are told or get the sense that, that they're quite comfortable with the idea of um, that suicide is an option mm -hmm. because to them it's a solution. Mm -hmm. or it ends the pain or something like that mm. um, do you have any um, steps that people might want to do next uh, uh, do they go and speak to their own GP and say I'm concerned about my friend do they continue the conversation or know when it is not in their they're, they're too mired in it mm -hmm. uh, yeah I, I'm only asking this because uh, there are a considerable number of entrants who send in works that have those sorts of questions. What more could I have done? What mm. should I have done if only I had? Um, we're not trying to answer those questions, in, in, but it, I know it is a theme that runs through those who are grieving. Mm. Mm. Yeah, look, I um, certainly understand that, um, that sometimes people don't see that there is any other way. So I think um, as a person who is um, uh, close to them or having the conversation with them, um, it brings to mind um, the fact of getting back to what we talked about is feeling comfortable about having that conversation and then knowing how to actually encourage that person to see that there is a way out of their situation. Um, there is kind of anecdotal um, evidence that um, states that a person can be, <clears throat> excuse me, in a suicidal state. If you can actually talk someone through um, and they're feeling suicidal, sometimes it only takes about 20 to 30 minutes of conversation to actually then be able to, for them to just feel that they can talk, that you don't have to have all the answers because none of us have all the answers. Um, but it's also important to understand that, that if you can actually get them to look at what the situation is, to what's happening, 
um, for them and to see that there is hope that there are other choices and it actually brings to mind that there are um, it's a it's called the Papageno effect um, and it's actually based on a um, on the um, magic flute opera that was written by Mozart so in that particular scene um, or in that particular opera um, it's the example is that Papageno um, got to the stage where he was feeling like there was no hope and that there was nothing to live for and I think his heart had been broken and he was just so devastated. But he had three good friends that apparently were able to support him and talk him through that and get him to see that there was hope. Um, and I think uh, we haven't really touched on um, the issue or the, um, the topic of hope, but it's basically... Um, it's getting that person to see that there is always hope that taking their own life is not the solution um, um, as opposed to um, and again historically from a writing perspective um, we talk about when we're actually educating um, journalists and journalism students and um, people working in the suicide and mental health prevention sector um, there's a um, another um, equal and opposite dynamic that's called the Werther um, syndrome and that's based on a book by Goethe which is written back in the um, late 1700s you may know of it it's called the sorrows of young Werther and so again um, there's no hard and fast evidence but um, research is very robust today and that's why as I say we work on very much an evidence-based um, perspective looking at um, educating the media around responsible reporting but I guess back in the late 1700s um, that wasn't in place but um, when Goethe's book around um, Werther was um, released the story was that he um, fell in love and he became very besotted with um, a particular female who was already engaged to somebody else and so through that dynamic um, he was never able to reconcile um, his relationship with her and so he took his own life and there was uh, again the say anecdotal evidence that um, the rates of suicide did increase quite markedly because people were reading the book and, and when they were in a similar situation to young Wurta um, they thought well there's no hope he took his own life and um, and so apparently it was broadly loosely autobiographical um, so they actually withdrew the book um, from um, the market and um, and so again that's that's a historical I guess reference to looking at how um, whether it's the media or whether it's a story um, can affect people who are feeling vulnerable if they're reading that particular story it's actually having an understanding of how that story can affect them and affect their decision making one way or the other. Mm, very interesting yes and so um, you've worked in drug and alcohol mm -hmm. and uh, I guess uh, there's grief associated in that sector too mm -hmm. um, which can be again a loss of hope Mm -hmm. uh, we had one story uh, that was shortlisted uh, an award winner a couple of years ago which was around um, a daughter, it was a mother's perspective of a daughter using ice and it was beautiful, beautifully written. Mm -hmm. It was called Losing Elizabeth and it captured the fact that uh, she lost her daughter over and over and over again. Mm -hmm due to the drug and alcohol uh, cycle of behavior. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's, there's uh, mental health and, uh, you know, unhealthy uh, sort of behaviors running through a lot of these um, uh, drug, ta drug and alcohol stories. Uh, any comment there about um, those who write about it, those who um, live with it and the grief and loss there? How are we going in that sector? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, yeah, I think it's a really great um, question. And I think that, um, again, as a, as a community and as a society, um, we also um, need to create those safe spaces for parents um, in particular to be able to um, support each other, to have an understanding of, um, the fact that um, drug or alcohol dependence can happen um, to anybody and um, and I think 
from my personal perspective, often there can be much more stigma associated with being the parent of a child with a substance use issue um, because of the fact that often there's a very chaotic behaviour, there's a lot of, you know, there can be often legal issues, there can be um, issues around, as I say, the, um, the son or the daughter creating chaos in the household as well. So the, um, again, the ripple effect of that actually happening in families can be quite traumatising. And, um, and again, I think writing about it um, can be very, very powerful for a lot of parents. But again, there are also um, some great um, initiatives from the point of um, view of supporting families. Uh, family Drug Support was started by Tony Trimmingham many, many years ago. Um, he lost his son to um, an overdose. And he realised at the time that there was just nowhere to go, no one to talk to um, about what had happened. And again, so it was that internalising the pain, it was the um, feeling like they couldn't talk about it because what would people think? And there was the, the, the whole stigma that was associated with that. So I think from the point of view of um, parents being able to um, come together um, and and talk about what is actually going on because the situation, as we know, can change from day to day. And um, so Family Drug Support, they offer um, either group programs like education programs around setting boundaries, around um, healthy relationships, around protecting other family members, you know, younger or older siblings. And they also have a phone support service as well. Um, so I think, again, um, with education and raising awareness around the fact that it can happen to everybody. And in my experience, I've seen um, people come through the doors from um, the families living in poverty right through to the most wealthy and very high profile um, families um, within Australia. So, um, and again, one of the other comments I'd like to make is a couple of the stories um, I recall um, also looking at reasons for drug and alcohol use is often it's a way of actually coping with trauma. Mm. And so it brings us back to what's at the root of the issue. And we often, um, again, we need to have an understanding that the, that the substance use is a way of actually numbing pain. It's a way of actually coping with something that may have happened to them um, f a very long time ago. And so, um, as we know, that there have been various um, royal commissions into institutional child abuse. And one of the other organisations that um, does a lot of fantastic work is the Blue Knot Foundation. So they... It's Blue Knot as in not... Yes, that's right. That but Blue Knot Foundation. That's right. That used to be called the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. And so they um, run programs for families who um, have either experienced abuse, uh, people who have survived um, physical, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, domestic, even domestic violence. Again, um, that's really coming up on the, um, on the landscape much more so and having an understanding of how to respond and, and um, how people can be at very high risk um, within family situations. So yeah, I think it's, um, I think again, writing about their experiences is, is, um, is really important. And they, as I say, there, there's a, probably a whole range of, um, of other ways of actually being able to express the pain and the hurt that's happening. Um, but getting back to the mother, um, you know, with, with the child, it's it's obviously the pain is very palpable in reading the story, and I think if that's one small that creates one small opportunity for the parent to be able to actually express how they're feeling or what they're going through, then I think it's fantastic that grief provides that platform for them to do that. Mm, and I think that the arts generally is a great way, as you said right at the beginning, to create a safe space to express yourself, whether it's music fine art, mm. sculpture, pottery, mm -hmm. writing. Uh, and I think the arts is a wonderful space to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's hope we grow from there. Thank yep. you for coming in today, Jennifer. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Karen.